Hey there, and welcome back into the Direct Selling Accelerator podcast. My name is Sam Hind, and today I had an absolute blast meeting a very special, very fun, and beautiful individual, Christine Widfelt from Chalk Couture. Now, Chalk Couture is a direct selling company based in the US, and they are what we considered to be, and Christine and I came up with this label, a toddler company. They've been around since 2017 and through amazingly difficult times, Christine has helped grow them to be over a $14 million company with tens of thousands of designers joining their ranks over the last few years. Now, what I really loved about this conversation was Christine shared with us the mission of the company, how they got started, what they get up to, but also she shared some really inspirational golden nuggets along the way as well. I love listening to her chat. We had so much fun. Lots of laughs were shared. But most importantly, I walked away feeling motivated and inspired and certainly uplifted by her beautiful personality. And I know you're going to have a great time listening to this episode as well. So tune on in. I know you're going to be fascinated by what they've been up to and you're going to love the mission behind this business. So enjoy this episode, get that pen and paper ready so you can jot down all of those golden nuggets and beautiful pieces of information along the way and enjoy. Everybody and welcome back in to the Direct Selling Accelerator podcast. My name is Sam, and today I'm joined by a very special guest. I'd like to welcome Christine Widfelt, CEO of Chalk Couture. Welcome on in, Christine. Hi, Sam. It's so great to be here. Fantastic to have you in here as well. And I'm really excited to introduce you to our listeners because we've just spent the last half an hour chatting away about all things Australian accents and difference between US and Australia and not really exactly where I was expecting this conversation to go. But I did say to you that I was so excited about having you come onto our podcast because when I heard you speak at the DSA conference, I'm going to say that was maybe a a couple of months ago now. I feel like time's just gone so fast. But I loved hearing you talk about what you've been up to with Chalk Couture. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a moment. But I did say you're just like a breath of fresh air. And I love hearing you speak about what your company is up to. So I'm so excited to hear from you today. And I know our listeners are going to love hearing a little bit about what you guys are doing over there. Well, thank you. So I feel like elephant in the room here. I really love to start by having you introduce a little bit about who you are, Christine, and also tell us a bit about Chalk Couture. We'd love to hear. Okay. This is Christine in a nutshell. I am a fanatical runner. I have a small Yorkie dog. I have three amazing children who have grown up to be awesome adult humans, which is the best thing ever. I have a very patient and forgiving husband named Pete. Um, We live in a small little suburb of Salt Lake City, Utah, in um, close to close to Salt Lake about a 45 minute drive away from the headquarters of Chalk Couture. I've been in the industry for more than 20 years. I absolutely love it for two reasons. The the two things that I love most about um, direct selling is number one, I think it's where innovation and ideas happen. If you want to get like the leading edge on really cool new products that you can't find anywhere else, look to direct sales. And then secondly, as, as a wife and a mom and someone who is loving and seeking and a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit, I love that there's no glass ceiling. You don't have to have a formal education to be successful. It It is 100% a meritocracy. If you want to get up every morning and work your butt off, you're going to have success. Um, and there's no, there's no pedigree that's required. And I just love watching people become their very best self and surprise them. And that's, that's what direct sales is all about for, for me. Um, Chalk Couture is a four-year-old company. We just celebrated our fourth birthday on July 1st. We oh, are, congratulations. At, oh, thank you. We're still, you're we're now a toddler. Toddler. Yeah. Toddler. Yeah. <laughs> we, we aren't going to school quite yet, but we're still young and fun. And that's, it's, it's actually a great age in the company because we are still young enough that there's just so much freshness and excitement in the company. But from an operational perspective, we're, we're starting to grow up. We have a lot of processes and systems in place 
that are best in breed that help us to avoid things like stockouts that help us turn around orders more quickly, that help us support our awesome field of designers. We call our reps designers with really meaningful community training events that make us feel uh, a little bit more grown up. And so I'm really, I'm really proud of that. I love our innovative products. I have a couple of them right in front. We are known for this beautiful baby. This is a reusable mesh silk screen that we call a transfer. You put paste on it just like this. This is some of our washable chalkology paste. You put it on the transfer on a surface, you peel it off and you can have artwork like this. How amazing is that? As tiny as this or as as big as what's behind me. I know we've probably got a whole lot of people right now going, oh my gosh, this is so cool. How do I get my hands on that? (laughs) It's so cool. Right now we're currently available in the US and Canada for both sales and for um, sponsoring, but we have the eye on the halls and walls of the entire world. That's that's the goal. So watch Again, this space. Absolutely. Yeah, watch the space. <laughs> That's awesome. So um, I'd love to hear, because I mean, I've, I've, I've heard from you before. Our listeners haven't, but I'd, I'd love for you to tell our listeners a little bit about the Chalk Couture story and mission, because there's some cool stuff that goes on behind the scenes there, right? I think it's really cool. A lot of people do ask, how did this company get started? How did these products even come to market? It's again, part of the thing that I love about direct sales, right? There's no glass ceiling. Anybody can be successful in it if they want to hustle. And this is where innovation happens. And our products and services were founded by two moms who were working together, who between the two of them have eight children. Their kids were very, very young. They were creative and kind of literally working on this in their garage developing the paste formula in buckets and Tupperware and mixing it up and testing it and retesting it. (laughs) Real Uh, science right there. (laughs) Yeah. I love, I mean, it has become a real science since then, but in the very early days, they, you know, had a baby on one knee and had a gallon of chalk paste on the other (laughs) and were going to craft fairs and taking their babies with them. And they just really believed in the, in the company and the product. And every time they went to an expo or an event, people would just stand and watch because when this gets pulled off of a surface and it's been inked, it's kind of a magic moment about how easy it is to create. And so almost everybody within it's, we do a better job of showing than telling about our product. In 10 seconds, you can watch it happen. Yeah. And so it, it also made just perfect sense to sell it via the direct selling model. You know, you could see this in a craft or a hobby store and think that's kind of a funny little thing. But when you could see it on social media, when you could see it in a quick video that someone would share with you via a text message, or if you could see it in person at a, at a little expo or a craft show, People got it immediately and it really helped the company take off. And that's why even just four years later, we're close to a $50 million company in just four years. That's amazing. So you guys at the moment, you're just in the U.S., is that right? We're in the U.S. and Canada. U.S. and Canada. Yep. Beautiful. Well, I'm I'm really excited to to get in and have a play with some of these products because for someone who is not a natural artist, <laughs> I'm not naturally creative. I'm looking at this stuff, going, "This looks like such an amazing concept for you people that want to be crafty, but yeah. really aren't." And that's I think that's the beautiful thing. We have, we have people tell us all the time, like you just did. I'm not crafty, but I think the creativity is in us all the time, and so. We're not trying to transform you into something that you're not. We're trying to reveal something that's already inside you. And I I think that's the coolest part of our company is when people pull that transfer off, they are so excited about what they did. They don't go, wow, what an amazing product. They go, oh my gosh, I can't believe what I I did. Yeah, I (laughs) made this and it looks awesome. Um, Sam, by the way, I'm sending you goodies. We've got you taken care of. Yay. (laughs) All right. So I'm going to have to take some photos of the things I create. How cool. For sure. So (laughs) exciting. So let's just, I want to take a little bit of a pivot here because I'll get really excited about being able to play with these products and we'll end up talking about it for the next half an hour. But (laughs) I really want to talk about your global impact. Something that Oxano, our company, is really passionate about is having a global impact. And I know that this is also something that you share as a company as well. And I've I've been having a little bit of a look at your what's of love. Did I say that right? You did, yeah. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what impact you guys are having globally as a company with that? Oh program? boy, would I love to. I love what's of love. 
So part of our mission statement actually says, we dare, we care, we share our light with others. And so four years ago, when I, when I first became CEO of this new fledgling company, I went in search of a charitable partner that would share our mission to dare and care and share light. First of all, we know th this is a truth that when you are doing well in a company, you should also do good. I believe mm -hmm. that firmly. If you are doing well, turn around and make sure you're doing good. Yeah. We also know that it's a message that resonates with customers and with the field as well. What are we doing to give back? What are we doing to make the world a better place? Um, and that's a key part of our mission. I went in search of a charitable partner that I wanted a partner, honestly, that was, I wanted a charity that was founded by a woman. I was looking for a yep. charity that was founded by a wife or a mom. A lot of our focus is on beautifying your home and making home a haven and a work of art. So I wanted uh, to find a charitable partner that had measurable impact, elevating the lives of women families, and building homes. And Watts of Love is extraordinary. They have a founder, Nancy Economo is her name. They're out of Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, when she was on a business trip with her husband, not very many years ago to the Philippines, she encountered extreme poverty. And one day she decided to volunteer in essentially a, a food pantry, a food kitchen. Yeah. And she noticed that a number of the patrons that were coming through to get food had terrible burns on their arms, on their faces, even the children. And she was told everybody down here has that because we all light and heat our homes with kerosene lamps. And kerosene is super dangerous. It puts out all kinds of fumes. Yeah. These little wicks are exposed. And so you're getting kids falling into the kerosene and getting terrible burns. And she went away from that trip feeling like I have to do something. Mm -hmm. She's an incredible inventor and entrepreneur, and she developed a solar light that has a battery that can rival the battery that is in my iPhone. Wow. It'll last about 10 years. You can charge it up during the day. You wear it on a strap on your head yeah. during the day. And then at night, it lights your home. And they found that it helps kids to study longer so they stay in school. It helps yeah. mom and dad to work at night after the sun goes down. It creates safety so that their homes are less um, penetrable to things like theft and robbery and other violent crimes. Yeah. Uh, and so we partner with them and we have a variety of products that people can buy that also generate a donation to Watts of Love. Yeah. We help yeah. our designers even can earn impact trips is what they're called to go to Malawi to do distributions of lights so they can see feet on the street, how those donations are, are being put to, to use. Yep. The other thing that we love is that for just $50 in donations, that raises w enough money for one light. And one light typically blesses the lives of seven people. And so wow. it's, it's also very easy to measure the impact. So I think that's one thing that's really important. When you're partnering with a charity, you want to feel like I am making a difference in the life of another yeah. human's life. And that has real impact. And so by saying $50 equals one light for 10 years for a family, and this is what they can do with it. It's been a really extraordinary journey. And Watts of Love is also a very young company. And so by partnering early on in both of our lives, we're growing together, which is really, really cool. And they've become a part of our DNA. And so when we say we dare, we care, we share our light, we quite literally share light by working yeah, with Watts of Love. That. Isn't so that great. awesome? I love it. And I can, I can feel your passion with this too, which is so exciting. I love seeing when a company has got a global impact like that. And I love hearing the stories. And what I think is just so special about that is that your, your field, your designers get to grow with that charity and see how they're actually personally having an impact, which is so amazingly powerful. So yeah. I love that. I should show you this. This is a, this is a picture of me. Can I see that? Yes. Yeah. Wearing their headlights. We're in the headlamp and I'm teaching um, an African mom in Malawi how to use the light. And because we speak different languages, I'm using a lot of hand signals. to Yes. Say, you can put it on your head and, and it's just extraordinary. And I think you come away from an experience like that, yeah. not feeling like you've served other people, but feeling like they've served you. It's oh. very, it's very powerful. 
It is amazing, isn't it? Actually, um, that that brings up a little uh, memory. One of the things that Greg and I are really passionate about is the organisation that we work with, Villages of Life, and we had the opportunity to head over there a couple of years ago. And you're talking about hand signals and saying that we come back so impacted. The person that ran the group that we went away with actually said to us that we think that Africa needs us, but we actually need Africa more. Yep. And it, it's so true. It's so, and it's not just Africa, it's it's any of these people because the thing is that there's there's so much to learn, I think, from being humble. And uh, one of the things that I remember being really incredibly powerful for us was the fact that you didn't have language. So, you know, and, and over there, they had a ton of different dialects. I don't know if it was the same for you guys, but you could learn oh, yeah. the language, but the next person you'd have to relearn yeah. um, how to speak to them. And so village to village, it was different, right? Yeah. Every, every village was a little different. Yeah. So very, very different. And so hand signals and, you know, and uh, body movement and face, it, it became the way to communicate. And I remember one particular day, we had just handed out a bunch of food parcels. And the reason I bring this up is it came up on a memory on our Facebook feed last night. And I was like, wow, I can't believe that that was two whole years ago today that we did this. But I remember that we didn't have the ability to talk to them. All we could do was use hand signals. And I was loving the fact that just through their eyes, it, it's like you could communicate an entire conversation just through eye contact. It was really insanely powerful. Yeah. But I remember this woman walks up to Greg and she uh, she looks at him and she she sort of pointed at him and pointed to herself and, and you know, he gave her a hug because he thought that's what she wanted. And, and then she grabbed his hand and she put it on his uh, on oh. her head and, and he was like, okay, she wants me to pray for her. And so he did. <laughs> and then she looked at him and she went like this. She sort of did the sign of the cross and, and then she sort of went like this, like, you know, and Greg went, yeah, like I'm a Christian, yeah. <laughs> and this woman, you just see, she just says in a couple of words something to the people around her. The next thing you know, there was a line of about 100 people lined up in front of Greg and all of them were grabbing oh. his hand and putting it on their head. And I, they're handing me their babies. So I'm sitting there holding <sighs> all of these little babies while they're getting Greg to pray for them. And we just thought, okay, well, I guess this is what we're here to do. And and one of our our translators came up after, you know, a good half an hour and he went, what are you guys doing? And I just said, well, this woman asked Greg to pray for her and now he's got a lineup. And he he asked them something and he came back, he goes, she asked you if you're a Catholic priest and you said yes. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. So it was quite funny. Anyway, we made a little bit of, we, we, <laughs> We wrapped it up about there and off we went. But I do love that. Sorry, it just reminded me with the hands. I love it. You know, one thing, is, it, you're so right. Like there, there are so many things that we can't say with words. Yeah. Um, other things that we can say with service. One of the things that Watts of Love had asked us to do was to bring bottles of um, fingernail polish. Oh. Because it gave us an opportunity to, as we would talk to the moms in the village, to hold their hand. Yep. to hold their hand and we would paint their nails. And so through that very small act of service, you get to hold their hands and you don't need to say a thing. You're just like, yeah. let me take five minutes and make you feel beautiful and make you feel cared about. And it was awesome. How cool is that? I'll have to do yeah. that next time we go to Burundi. That's I hadn't even thought of doing that. And, and that'd be something too that they just wouldn't have experienced. Before right, right. right. Yeah. What a clever idea. I love I that. Know. And did you find as well that the the human contact was so much more prominent over there than it is? I mean, I don't know about for you guys, actually, this might, this might be where we start talking about the difference between the US and Australia here. But I know here, there's this kind of culture where it's like, this is my space, that's your space. And you only come into my space if you're invited. We're sort of you know, and COVID has just made that worse, right? Because you well and truly separate from one another. Do you do you guys have that same, you know, yes, personal space? Of course. Going on? And it and it has been so hard to navigate with COVID as we yeah. try to get uh, through COVID and past COVID, yeah. trying to reestablish those um, boundaries of where we stand and how we talk and how we how we wear pants when we talk to people, yeah. how we don't just turn off our camera and then multitask when we're in yeah. a meeting. Mm -hmm. It's, it's really different. And yes, you know, you said you held a lot of babies as soon as they would figure out that this was also a camera. I was always yeah. shooting video of kids. Um, then the moms would line up with their babies and they'd be yeah. like, and they, and it was clear as they pointed to my phone, they wanted mm -hmm. me to 
take a picture of my baby, take a picture of me with my baby, like yeah. make a memory, make it happen. Yep. And so I actually found that interestingly, technology was a great connector. Um, they always yeah. wanted to be close and to talk. And to ha- have you play with their kids, but the yeah. second that you could take a picture or yeah. something to show them, so many of them, I think, have never seen themselves on video, have never seen themselves yeah. in a photo. So exciting. Well, it, it goes even further than that because many of them we found had never even seen themselves. They didn't yeah. have mirrors or glass or, you know, they're all in straw huts. And for a lot of them, they don't technically exist. They don't have birth certificates to say that they're here. So for these guys, it was almost like proof of my existence. And we had a a professional photographer um, who just happened to be one of the people in our group. He wasn't there to take photographs, but he brought all of his equipment with him. And I've got video of him taking a photograph of this big group of kids. And then he'd flip the camera around so they could see it. And the cheers and the roars of laughter and excitement from them, because they just saw a picture of what they look like was was unbelievable. And you Uh. just don't think about things like that. And I think that the takeaways for me too are it's it's a tough scrabble lifestyle living in living in Malawi. It's the it's the sixth poorest nation in the world. Yeah. And yet you also will see such a sense of community, yeah. such a sense of support. And you know, you, you get there and you're like, what what are all the email that are in my inbox? What are all the things mm-hmm. that I need to do? And then you're in these lovely villages where they will sing to welcome you, where yeah. they will come out and bring you lunch of um, a fufu made from cassava and so abundantly sit and share with you on a log the the bounty that they have and you're like wow like they've got it figured out like they've got the important stuff the stuff that really matters they've got this in spades they may not have television they may not have a satellite dish on top of their hut they may not have the latest model of car or even any car they may drive on a bicycle if they're really wealthy or they walk and I don't mean to minimize how challenging the, the landscape and the lifestyle are, but the joyfulness and the connectedness of families yeah. is something pretty telling for sure. Absolutely. And no, I totally get where you're coming from with that. And actually, I've, we've we've got a little um, podcast interview that we've done with one of the leaders of Villages of Life who talks a bit about the the, the vision of that organization, which will come, be coming out in the next few weeks. But the the really interesting thing was that I found that the the human contact and community that you're talking about was so powerful that it taught me something about how little we rely on that. And just that, the touching of hands you were talking about, the human contact. Uh, over in Burundi, which is the second poorest country in the world, we actually found that the joy and the, the demeanor of the people over there was so different to what it was at home. And in fact, when I came home, I had this feeling like something was missing. And when I realized it was the fact that I didn't have people constantly touching me, holding my hand with their arm around me, I really missed that. That human contact is such a big thing. And then COVID happened and I just went, well, now it's getting even worse. You know, I can't even hug someone to say hello anymore. And it worried me at that point, what's going to happen to us as we're moving into this whole new season where we're discouraged from having that that human contact that, that, you know, they've discovered is just such a valuable. It it really showed me how much we need it. You know, I think we have people who say, we don't need it. I mean, I love talking to you virtually. It's fun. It's easy. And it's so mind blowing to me that I'm in Salt Lake City and you're in Tasmania and we're talking real time. Technology is amazing. But to me, one of the things, the big takeaways from COVID was we do need to be together. And as as important as social selling is, the Mm. importance of making one-on-one connections, even if they start from doing a Facebook Live, even if it starts from a webinar or a podcast, we can't think that that's a substitute. We can reach a lot more people via these platforms. But at the end of the day, if we're not finding the one and figuring out what makes them tick and what their kids' names are or their husband's children are, then we are missing it. And I think that's one of the the hard learnings of the pandemic was for me was this is not a substitute for being together. It's just not. Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be very interesting to see what happens over the next 12 months. But this actually leads me to where I wanted to to steer next with you. And I'd really love to hear about, you know, with you guys are a very young company. How did last year or the last 18 months, how has that affected your field, your designers and their businesses? Good question, because we are such an in-person and demonstrable business. We uh, social media really lit the, the fire 
because so many people could see the product. Like I said, in a 10 second video, you can see more about how our product works than in a half an hour discussion. Um, So social media really helped to put us on the map. And yet so many of our designers, it's all about, we call them me and three, where you have small workshops with three other people, a me and three shop where you're making a project. Or where you're going to a Pinners conference or um, a vintage market days, a lot of these smaller expos that all got canceled last year. Yeah. And interestingly, from a momentum perspective, last year we actually grew. And part of that can be because we're young. But I think part of it, too, was driven by people were seeking connection and they were willing to seek it in online venues, even if they were not particular fans of yeah. Facebook. They may have joined Facebook, may have joined our company because they needed additional connections while they were stuck at home or Mm -hmm. while they were furloughed from a job. And so we were really excited about that because we're like, we already have this muscle in person to person um, connection. And now we can develop this muscle in social media training. And I think it was really beneficial for us. I think it's been more difficult this year. This it's, Mm -hmm. it's summertime in the U.S., as people begin to go back to their quote unquote normal lives, they're having to revisit what normal looks like. Can I go back to now I've got muscles on both sides. Can I go back to the muscle of being out with people? And there, I think we're having to relearn some of the things that used to be very comfortable to us. And so Mm. we're definitely seeing that in our business. Some people are like, you know what? I feel pretty comfortable staying home and just doing Facebook lives. And it's, it's less preparation than if I'm doing going out and doing a workshop or if I'm doing an expo. And as they just barely start to come back online, I think people are trying to evaluate if that's still a fit. And we're really encouraging them to do so because we know that power of one-on-one connection. So yeah. it, it'll be interesting because last year, everything was just so shut down. You didn't have a choice. You had to do everything online. Yeah, and now absolutely. there are more choices. And sometimes... Sometimes when people get a lot of choices, it's a little paralyzing. Which which thing do I do first? It was a really interesting process because we watched a lot of people last year who had avoided social media and online for so long be forced into a position where they had to they had to embrace it or they they put their business on hold. We saw some people put their businesses on hold because they just weren't willing to do it, but we were really blown away that majority of people went all right, let me add it. Just show me what I got to do. And they, yeah. they jumped in and they had a go. What's been really interesting is, and what you've just said there reinforces what we've noticed. And that is instead of people treating it like, and, and many have gone, look, this is the new normal and we've got this new hybrid. You know, we've got online, we've got in person, let's do a bit of both of these things. But I have noticed more and more people where they can are reverting back to the old comfortable. You know what? I didn't I, I didn't love the online thing. I learned how to do it, but I'm just going to go back to my old comfortable and I'm going to go back to doing in person. And they're sort of ditching this new skill they've learned that maybe they didn't quite crack. Maybe they were getting close, but they didn't quite get there yet. And so it's still feeling quite hard, you know, when you get yeah. a new challenge and it just it feels And, and hard. I guess my take is why not both? You know, if, yeah. if, you were, if you were forced to do this one thing, you can also, I mean, it just diversifies your tool set. And I think that's, that's what I'm always trying to encourage our field to do is become yeah. that jack of all trades. Keep experimenting with a little bit of everything yeah. um, because you want to be diversified. That's what's going to give you a really healthy business yeah. um, is making sure that you You may have a preference of one over another, but as long as you can excel and dabble in each one of these, you're going to be so much happier than if you put all your eggs in one basket, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And look, we've we've learned the hard way, I think, here in Australia in the last few months because everyone started to get comfortable with, ah, we're on top of this COVID thing and what happens? We all go back into lockdown and that's where we're at at the moment. And so, of course, it's led to this, uh, you know, it's feeling of I, I've got to go back to this whole online thing. It's it's taken away, and and I know how much we all want to be in person. We all want to be in. Look, I'm frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick of speaking to a camera every single day. I miss people, but yeah. it is it is what we have to do at the moment. And I really encourage those people that are just feeling like I haven't quite cracked it yet. Just just know that it may very well just be one post away or one demonstration away or one conversation away. And sometimes that challenge, that difficulty is, is just that, you know, you You don't know how close you are. 
Yes. Okay. So Sam, we were talking earlier and you're like, do you have a favorite quote? And I said, <laughs> I do. And I said, I, I'm, I'm not even going to tell you what it is until later, but it fits exactly. Here, right, right, go. <laughs> so let's hear My it. My favorite quote is, I believe it's a, I think it's Ralph Waldo Emerson, but it is, that which we persist in doing becomes easier. Not that the nature of the thing has changed, but that our ability to do it has increased. And I know that sounds yeah. super obvious, but it speaks to that whole thing that if you keep doing something, yeah. one day you're going to wake up and you're going to be like, this is easy. That thing that I could not do, yeah. I now can do. And if you stop doing it, you do not know how close you were yeah. to breaking through to the other side. And so I feel like that's that's actually the quote I say all the time to my I children. I love that. With regard to like practicing the piano or competing. One of, them, one of mine is a, tra- a track star. You never know how close you are to breaking yeah. the four minute mile until you keep doing it. And then yep. once you've done it, you're like, this thing is easy, but it wasn't when you started. Do you know, I, I love that. And it, it actually makes me think of a, you know, I, we're talking about toddlers, you're a toddler company right now, but you know, when babies first learn to walk, it is so super hard for them. But here's the thing you notice about a baby. They don't know that it's meant to be hard. Yeah. <laughs> So they keep trying, they fall down, they get back up, they fall down, they get back up until one day walking, who knew, you know, like when was that ever hard? I I don't ever remember that being hard, but they don't realize that it's supposed to be hard. And it's, and Jill, uh, we were talking uh, with Jill from the DSA the other day, we were having a conversation about this because you're also a runner as is she. And um, we were talking about marathons and she was saying that 10K can seem like a really, really long way until you do it two or three times. And then suddenly it doesn't feel so long anymore and so hard because now you know you can do it. Yes. And I, I love that. I think it's. Yes. It's, and in fact, once you run a number of 10 Ks, you get to a certain point where when you hit that 6.2 miles, your body says, I can keep going. Yeah. And it's kind of magical when you get to that part, you're like, wait a minute this used to absolutely kick my butt. And now my body is even telling me I'm fine. Let's keep, let's keep going. And I think that's, that's, what's really cool. I I think you also said something really cool about the baby that the baby doesn't know it's hard. Mm. We, as the parents of the baby or the people who are coaching the baby on, um, we're allowing them to fall down and fall Mm. and we're telling them it's okay. Like falling down is okay. And I think somewhere Mm. along the way we lose that as adults, we get so nervous to, to fail in front of each other. And if we try something, we're awkward and we're apologetic. That's something that I, I try to encourage in my team members at Chalk Couture mm-hmm. at Chalk Central, we call it. And that is the, the concept of graceful failures um, mm-hmm. or to, to quote um, Buzz Lightyear, falling with style. Yeah. Like falling <laughs> with style is really a thing. And yeah. if you're like, you know what? I either win or I learn. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. You, we, we try to create a culture where failure is part of learning how to walk because otherwise the baby's not going to do it right the first time. And neither will our IT team when they make a new deployment and not every product is perfect. And if we set things so high, that bar so high that you have to be able to run the first time you stand up to walk, the baby's going to say, then never mind. I'll just sit here and let you carry me everywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But all they think about is the next step, right? Yes. It's the next yes. step. That's all they're Because really falling about. is fine. If I fall yeah. down, it's okay. No one's going to get mad at me. That's exactly right. As like, If I take one step, I fall down. Next time, maybe I'll take two. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's the same all the way through life. You know, we were having a, Greg and I sat down on Saturday. I, I told you we ran the business breakthrough seminar, which was the first time that we'd done that. But what was really interesting about it was we had to pull together a ton of technology to pull in two other speakers from other parts of Australia. And we had to make it look like this was a professionally filmed broadcast. So it took a lot of programs. It took a lot of setting up. It took a lot of planning the process to keep, because we had to keep everyone interested for four hours. It was a long time. We sat down at the end of it and I just, I looked at Greg and I went, I can't believe how, how amazingly well we just did that. And three years ago, I would have sat here and gone, I don't even, I, I don't even know where to start with the technology. How did I get to this point where we've managed to put this whole thing together and we just had everything sitting here ready to go? And I realized it was because we chipped away one little thing at a time. And yeah. suddenly we had this amazing opportunity here where we knew exactly what to do, but it didn't, it didn't happen by taking a big, you know, trying to eat the whole meal at once. 
Yeah. Yeah. I love it. So powerful. So I do want to just talk to you for a little moment about the people in your field, because I think that there is a, you know, a lot of people that jump in and think, you know what, I'm going to do this direct selling thing. I, I'm watching somebody else and, and they've told me this business is great and there's all this opportunity and I'm going to jump in and I'm going to have a go at it. But there's a big difference between those that succeed and those that don't. And I'd love to get your take on what you believe is the difference between those that take a business and turn it into something amazing and those that really struggle and can't quite get to where they want to be. Yeah. You know, um, it's so sometimes common sense is not common practice, right? We we know that. So some of what my thoughts on that are, you're going to say, duh, Christine, everybody knows that, but, but sometimes we know things and we don't do them. So Um, I, here's, here's my analogy. Um, people know that I am passionate about the, the rule of the flywheel. And if you know what a flywheel is, it is a big, heavy piece of machinery. It sits on an, on an engine and it powers the engine. And the first time that the flywheel goes around, there's a lot of resistance to it. The flywheel is heavy and it's slow and it takes a whole lot of um, energy, either energy or fuel to make it make one revolution. And that's a little bit the way it is in our business. We say, okay, I'm ready to go. I'm super excited. I'm going to sign up 10 people. I'm going to make a ton of craft and I'm going to sell them online on Etsy or whatever else. And I'm going and they put all this effort in and they make one rotation of the flywheel. And then they tell themselves, now I'm going to sit and rest because that was hard. That was really hard. A lot of effort into it. And I just, now I'm tired. And what I always tell people is that when you, the best time to make the next rotation of the flywheel is right after the first one, because you've created this tiny bit of momentum. So if the first rotation is super hard, the second rotation is still hard. It's just a slightly less bit hard. And the third one is going to get a little easier. And the fourth one's going to get a little easier. And then the principle of the flywheel is once you have done it consistently for so long, it actually will create a certain amount of inertia that it would actually be hard for you to stop because you I put off the analogy in so much. So once upon a time, I was sitting on, on a beach in Hawaii with one of my top achievers. She was an amazing seller and an amazing sponsor. Yeah. And she turns to me and she checks her phone and she says, oh, I just got a new team member. I just got a notification that I got a new team member. <laughs> And I said, tell me how you did that because you were sitting right here on this beach with me in Hawaii. Yeah. And she goes, Christine, I have been doing this so consistently and so long for so many years. My flywheel, because she knows how I feel about the flywheel. She's like, my flywheel is spinning so strong and so fast. I couldn't stop it if I wanted to. Um, And I think that's where we're trying to get to is um, do it consistently so that these things become a habit. And you trust that process, trust the process. I would say marry the process and divorce the results. Mm -hmm. If we stop looking at the results and just trust that we do the process, Mm -hmm. the results will come and then they will come to the point that then you actually can take a day off. You can go on a short vacation. It won't, it won't be so hard to do that heavy lift. And it goes back to that quote that you and I were just talking about. If we would just persist in doing, you know, that which we persist in doing becomes easier. Yeah. Not that the nature of the thing has changed. It doesn't change, but the flywheel will spin faster. And so what I always tell people is if you're willing to commit to it and be excited, don't give yourself just a one week plan or 10 days. Tell yourself, I'm going to do this for a month. I'm going to make sure it's a habit. And then I'm going to, instead of giving myself some yeah. breathing time, keep going while you're still going. It's just so much easier to, and that's honestly the difference I think between people who succeed and people who don't is that they're willing to trust the process, divorce the results yeah. and just be consistent. And the thing is, it doesn't, you, you know, this too consistency, like back to, back to running what's consistent. I, I used to run every single day during COVID. I started running. I'll tell you this. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit this. Um, I've been a runner for a long time, but on March 13, 2020, when the world shut down, I told myself, I'm going to run at least six miles a day. Um, And that's roughly a 10K, right? Yeah. 10K is 6.2 miles. We've we've had to have these conversations about, you know, like we've got to get the language straight before. we. Yes. 10K, 6.2 miles. And I told myself, I'm going to run a 10K every single day until this is over. 
And I naively thought, oh, this is going to take two or three weeks. And so I ran every single day without even giving myself a rest day, without changing it up. And about three or four months in, I started getting shin splints. Yeah. My ankles were killing me and I couldn't stop. I had told myself, I am the flywheel. I have to be Mm -hmm. consistent. But being consistent doesn't mean that you have to do it every day. It's about finding what consistency is. And so believe it or not, I I ended it. I allowed myself to stop on December 31st. I went all the way from Oh my goodness. December 31st. I told myself I'm going to break that. I now have my goal. My goal for 2021 was do not run more than four days per week. And yep. my husband said, you are crazy. You're the only person I know whose New Year's resolution is to, is do to less. exercise less. <laughs> but for me, it brought back balance. Yeah. It, it helped my health. And it did not make me suffer as a runner. And so I think, you know, consistency in the business, it doesn't mean that you have to push yourself to the point of exhaustion. Find the cadence that's right for you. And if Mm. posting um, consistently, but not doing these huge, dramatic, amazing photo shoots every day where you're exhausted, you can bring it down. Consistency can be whatever it needs to be, but don't, don't burn yourself out. Yeah, absolutely. I love that so much. Do you know, I was getting little shivers as you were talking about the flywheel because it is so, so true. And this is, I feel like this has kind of been the pattern through the conversation today as we talk through, you know, those challenges and that pushing that little bit further that just, just keep going. But, you know, I'm, I want to come to social media. I, there's two things on my mind right now is balance and social media. You've brought up two things that I really want to uh-huh. talk about. So let's start with the social media because I feel okay. like it just goes hand in hand with the flywheel. And one of the things that I notice happens so much for people is, you know, they try things once. They do a week of posting. They put one post out there that someone said to do. They do one live and it, it's hard. It doesn't feel natural. It feels uncomfortable and it doesn't get them results. Maybe no one showed up to their live. Maybe no one interacted with their post. And so they stop. And what we know to be true is that flywheel, that same effect, the momentum that you get from just you put one post out there, you get one interaction, do it again. Next time you'll get two. The next time you might get four, but it's a momentum thing. It's about pushing it out there in consistency. And this is where we built our 14-day challenge was to show people the power of consistency and momentum. But I'd love to hear from you if you've got any hot social media tips for our listeners from what you guys have learned over the last 12, 18 months, because you spent a lot of time working with your designers on, you know, how do they demonstrate on social media? So have you got any hot tips for our listeners? Oh my gosh, hot tips are, first of all, I have to make a comment on how you were even talking about, you know, show up even if there's, I often say show up anyway, even if there's nobody there, you show up anyway, because um, early on in my career, I worked for Stephen R. Covey. He's the man who wrote the seven habits of highly effective people and um, a variety of other leadership books, principle centered leadership, first things first, a lot of great, great books. But he often used to say the first and most important commitment that we make every day is to get out of bed. And that commitment is only to ourselves. And I think about that, him saying that, and he said it to me, the first and most important commitment we make every day is to ourselves. And so when your alarm goes off, he's like, and you hit that alarm and want to sleep in, Mm -hmm. he's like, the only person who you're not following through on is is you. So when my alarm goes off or when I get up, I, I always strive to get out of bed right away because I want to honor myself. Yeah. And that's that's one of the things that I think is really important when it comes to social media is um, honor yourself. You are doing this even if no one else is watching. You show up anyway because you honor yourself. And you have before I often say to um, before you before you have something to sell, mm-hmm. make sure you have something to say. People don't want to follow you because you have a product to say. They want to engage with you because you're another human and you have interesting ideas and you have a perspective like honor, honor yourself. And when you do that, another thing I often like us to say is our, our vibe attracts our tribe. The more genuine and real that you show up, that vibe is what attracts like-minded people. And if you're going to build customers and relationships, or even decide that you want to build a team. You want people you like. You want people that you would genuinely want to hang out with. Like, like I'm talking to you, Sam, 
I guarantee you, if if we were next door neighbors, we'd be friends. We'd sit on the patio, we'd have a drink of Diet Coke, we'd watch the sunset, and we'd gossip about our kids. We'd be we, talking about favors versus swimsuits. Right. Yeah. Their swimsuits, Sam, their swimsuits. <laughs> <laughs> we totally would be talking about all that. But that's the that's the point of social media is I, I think the biggest hot tip is show up anyway and show yeah. up as yourself because you don't want to hang around with anybody who is not your tribe. So Absolutely. Oh my gosh. It's all- like it's like you just you're speaking <laughs> my heart here right now because <laughs> I'm so glad. Yay. I I love hearing this because this is one thing that I feel like Greg and I are preaching until our face goes blue is the importance of working with your one key ideal perfect tribe. And we actually call it your tribe. We call it tribe training. We do. I love Um, that. I have no idea. There is so much more joy you'll have in your business when you work with the people that bring you joy, that you connect with naturally, that are naturally drawn to you. And they're so much easier to attract. But we fall into this habit of trying to please everyone. And by doing that, we please no one. Yes. Or worse, we do the compare and stare. We look at somebody who's like, she's being successful. She's she's sponsored 20 people last month, or she's got, you know, 30 people turning into tuning into her life. So I've got to crack the case and do what she's doing. And I'm like, number one, you won't be authentic. And number two, even if you're able to pull it off, you won't be happy with the results. That won't, that's not your tribe. You, yeah. you don't want to be anybody else other than you. And that's really, really hard for people to do yeah. in this business is to feel like it's okay if I show up anyway and I show yeah. up as myself. Just honor yourself, honor yeah. the person that you are. And you're just interesting. You are an interesting human. I think sometimes people need permission to be themselves. And that's that's Maybe. where, you know, I, I just want to put this out here right now that you're not going to crack it until you understand that showing up as you, because you are the only thing that sets your business apart. You're the only thing that makes your business unique. And people come to you because they connect and resonate with you. So you need to understand that the key to being successful in your business is being your own beautiful, incredible, unique self, especially on social media, because that's the one thing no one else can duplicate. Yeah. Especially when, um, when you have thousands of people and they're all representing the same product, yep. the difference is you. And so people who know me know I am a crazy runner. I love Diet Coke. I'm a Disney fan and I have a Yorkie and I can talk for hours and hours with people about dogs, books. I'm a, I'm a voracious reader. And when yeah, I'm well, running, this is where we'll go next. <laughs> oh, yay. When I'm running, I'm always listening to a book on Audible. And if you yeah. want to have an hour long conversation with me, let's talk about what we're reading and why we're yeah. reading it. And what's exciting to us like that's those connections are what help people bond. Yeah. And then they can make other decisions because you've it, you've established that credibility, that trust, that, I don't know, that something. Yep. Now, hang on just a sec, Christine. I need to know what's your favorite Disney movie? Oh, there are a ton. So, but if I were honestly to narrow it down to one, mm-hmm. I have a, my favorite Disney princess is Belle because oh. she's a reader and she's smart. So she's, she's beautiful. She's independent and she reads yep. and the happiest moment in her in her saga is when she finds the library at the Beast's Castle. Yes. And I'm like, she's my girl. <laughs> um, my favorite movie, honestly, from Disney is um, the Pixar movie Up. I think oh. it's so beautiful and sweet. The yeah. elderly couple's relationship. Yeah. I've always wanted to be like, if I can be, if I can have a relationship that strong with my husband and my family, yeah. Um, yeah. then I've done something right. So I don't know. Do that, you like that, steer that's... Pete across, you know, just... What watch this? We need we need to watch this movie again, honey. <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. Wait, wait, touch, touch. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. That's yours. What's, so what's your favorite Disney movie? Favorite uh, Disney? Do you know? Well, I was actually just going to say to you that it's Beauty and the Beast, and it, it's <gasps> get out. In, yeah, no, seriously. And but here's why: because I grew up with my dad, just the two of us. And we used to love musicals and we grew up in a country town. So he used to, we used to go on a road trip every now and again, maybe every couple of years. And he would take me to a musical. And the first musical he ever took me to was Beauty and the Beast. And it was one of the most powerful memories I have. It was so amazing. 
And I just, it, he ended up taking me twice because I loved it so much. But it's just always held a little special spot in my heart because, yeah, Belle is that like real independent. She knows what's right and wrong. And she even stands up to the beast. Like you will yeah. not, you know, no, you can't behave like, like that. She fixes him and rescues him, yes. not the other way around. Yeah. <laughs> I love him. Yeah. Yeah. So good. <laughs> Definitely not where I thought this conversation was going to go, but I'm glad it went there. <laughs> All right, we're going to have to like I was speedy up here because um, I, I feel like we could talk for hours, but I do want to ask you about your books and Audible because we've been slowly building a little reading list. One of the great things is that we have such incredible people come onto this podcast and they've all read, you know, some amazing books for different times in their life, different challenges, different experiences. So I'd love to add some of your favorite reads to our list, Christine. Would you, oh. would you care to share? Well, there are, you know what? There are books that I love that are business books. So I'll share a couple of business books. Yep. But then there are a couple of books just about life that I think. Yeah. We've, got, our- we've got quite a big, we've got, you know, okay. fiction novels in this list. There's really you know, anything. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I will tell you, I think my, my two favorite books of all time that are fiction are both young adult books. I love the, the book thief by Marcus Zusak. Oh, I think he's yes. been an Aussie. Isn't he an Aussie? I feel like he's an Aussie. Um, an, an, an Aussie. He's an Aussie. An Aussie. <laughs> I think he. I think he's from Australia. But he's but that book I love is my number one book. My number two would be The Giver by Lois Lowry okay. um, because they both talk about gifts that we have and what we do with them. So both of those books are about young protagonists finding their way in a world that is kind of against them. And yep. using their gifts to make a difference. Um, so I love that. Those are my two favorite nonfiction All books. All right. I've got them written the, down. Uh, or fiction books. On the nonfiction side, I love, love, love um, the book. It's called The Four Disciplines of Execution. It's a business book that's actually published by Franklin Covey. Um, it was written by a friend of mine. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list. But it's called The Four Disciplines of Execution. And it, it is all about goal setting. And the the reason that I like it is that we tend to set too many goals for ourselves. I'm going to do this. I'm going to sell this much. I'm going to sponsor this much. I'm going to do this with my website. I'm going to do this with social media. And this book teaches the discipline of what's called a WIG, a wildly important goal, W-I-G. And the concept of the WIG is none of us should have any more than two WIGs at a time. Because when we have 10 goals, we don't accomplish any of them. Yeah. And we're, we're just so busy running around doing everything. And the, the focus of four disciplines of execution really teaches us how to get stuff done and prioritize the two wildly, mo- the wildly important goals that we have. And then we can get to the next one and to the next one. So I've read it before, but I just reread it like a month ago. Yeah. And then I think you and I were talking about, I love the book Shoe Dog, which yes. is um, do you, have you read that yet? No, but it's not. It's next oh on my, my list. It's next on my list. I've I've got Run Like a Girl is is the next one on my list. I'm currently reading. Where is it gone? It was sitting on my desk here. I'm currently reading Eat That Frog. Eat That Frog. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's Eat That Frog. Eat That Frog. Yeah, which is yeah. actually really perfect because my frog is I'm not reading enough. So I'm going to start my reading with a book about eating the frog, which for me is reading. Um, yeah. And then my next one on my list uh, is Run Like a Girl. And then I'm I'm heading over to uh, to Shoe Dog. Shoe Dog. I wanna, so gonna, tell us a bit about Shoe Dog. Shoe Dog. You told me, but tell our listeners just quickly. Well, uh, Shoe Dog is, uh, the reason I read it is that years ago in my career, whenever we'd have a challenge at the at my job, the CEO would say, does Nike have these problems? I don't think so. I don't think Nike has any of these problems. And, and I would just be like, I don't know. Maybe Nike has it all figured out. And we're the only ones that are struggling. Um, and then this amazing bi- autobiography, it is by Phil Knight, who is the co-founder of Nike Shoes. He writes about the early days um, founding Nike. And he himself is a runner. So I thought that was really interesting. Yep. Talks about him being a runner at Oregon State University and founding this company and wanting to build a better shoe. And guess what? Nike has nothing but problems. The book is about problem after problem after problem. So I wish I could go back to that old CEO that I had with the book in hand and go, yes, yes Nike had a ton of problems. You just didn't see them. And I yeah. think that's the whole point. The takeaway to me is, you know, you read the, a book like Shoe Dog and it's actually not about shoes. It's about problems 
and how to solve them and the thinking that goes behind solving problems to become world class. And that's what Nike has done. They've just, they've stuck it out and they keep solving problems because they just believe anything can be figured out. Anything can be solved if you just stay in it. So yeah. that's 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 your synopsis of Shoe Dog. So I love that. Pretty I cool. can't wait to read that one. That's definitely on the list here. I feel like we've got some some uh, fantastic <laughs> books to add in there for everybody. And <laughs> this, I feel like this whole chat has just been so filled with golden nuggets. I feel so inspired walking away from this. <laughs> oh, I've too. loved yeah. love chatting with you today. I do want to ask you one more fun question. If you could choose one superpower, what would that be? Um, honestly, that I would never have to sleep. And that while the rest of the world is asleep, I would be able to do fun things. I could take up new hobbies. I could pick up new crafts. Yep. I'd love to write a novel. All the many things that um, when I have to go to bed at night, I always think, oh, if I had just another eight hours, I could go up. <laughs> so if I could not waste sleep, of time, right? Sleep but in. have still lots of pep and still be productive, that yep. would be my, what would yours be? What's your superpower? To be a speed reader, I think. Oh, to- Yeah. Yep. To be able to consume books at a much faster rate, that would be my superpower. See, I should probably do that. Mine is just so I can stay awake longer and probably just read more. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, I'd like to be, you know, I'd love to be able to read. You know, you, you get, um, is it now, who is this? Is it Steve Jobs was reading, he, he would walk around with a bag of books and he would finish the entire bag every week. Just amazing, amazing, amazing. But yeah, anyway, I, I think that would be my superpower would be to you know, finish my bag of books a week. Well done, Sam. Good choice. Yeah. Good choice. Now, just as we finish up this whole conversation, I've been thinking, right, I really got to ask Christine this. Are you ready? Yes. Now, I've told you I've been trying to run my first ever half marathon. Now, the big C word has got in the way multiple times. I was supposed to run it two weeks ago didn't happen. So I'm still training. It's been a year of training. I'd love one piece of advice from you, runner to runner, to help me run better. Oh, you didn't prep me with that. No, I know. (laughs) I love it. I think runner to runner, here's, here's what helps me run. I find my own cadence and I stop watching what everybody is doing around me. Yep. And then I get frustrated or tired what I find I start to do. I had a really bad fall about five years ago while I was running. Um, there was an uneven pavement and I snagged my foot on it, got a concussion and hurt my face, oh, wow. dislocated my finger. And so ever since then, after I ran, I found that I was running down. I was looking yeah. at the sidewalk, trying yeah. not to fall. And I also do that when I'm tired. So mm-hmm. runner to runner, here's my one piece, find your own cadence. It's okay to go slow. Yeah. Don't give yourself permission to walk jog and it doesn't matter if it looks silly and look up, look up when you're running. Because to me, I also, part of the reason I wanted to start running was that it restored balance and relaxation to my workaday life. Yeah, And I live in a really beautiful part of Utah and I miss it when I just focus on the road. And so I think that's a takeaway too, for direct selling is that if you, if you need to rebalance, do the thing that brings you joy, look up, lift, lift your chin up and stop looking at your feet, fearing that you might fall. And for me, it's, if I look up, I see the beautiful mountains. I see the amazing yeah. fir trees. I see the trail that I'm running on and that's okay. And if I fall, but I'm looking at that beautiful vista, it's probably worth it. O- honestly, look up. Yep. I love that. What a beautiful, beautiful way to end this podcast episode. I think that's fantastic. I'm going to write that down on my quote. <laughs> I think that's right. <laughs> look up. No, so perfect. Thank you so much. This has been such an enlightening chat. I really, really enjoy getting to know you a little bit better, Christine, and hearing about what Chalk Couture has been getting up to. And I can't wait for you guys to appear here in Australia. Us too. We're right there with you, Sam. We'd love to be there. Fantastic. Well, thank you for taking the time out today. I'm sure our listeners uh, have loved hearing you chat about uh, all things direct selling uh, and your vision and mission as a business. So thank you for taking the time out today. It's been great chatting. Thanks, Sam. It's been my pleasure. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in and we will see you all again next week. Bye for now.